that the parent can um, ask the, or, or guide the child in another direction, away from Sheena Easton, Prince, or whoever else you've been complaining about. There's always that possibility. What's up everybody? My name is Shantoria. Welcome to the video and I pray you all are doing well. You know, the topic of censorship in TV and film, and in this case music, has always been very fascinating to me because I was interested in learning about the parental advisory label after I made the creation and short life of Betty Boop for my second channel. I'll link the video down in the description below. And I just went down a rabbit hole of <laughs> the TV and film rating system. It gave me the idea for this video and a future one. And I feel like this will create a very healthy and respectful discussion in the comments. So grab a snack, subscribe, and let's learn about how artists got their favorite pal on their records. I can sum up this chapter by saying that it was Prince's fault that the pal even exists, but that'll be slightly inaccurate. <laughs> also, there was points that actually stood out to me in the hearings of John Denver, Dee Snyder, and Frank Zappa, so I'll be sharing those in a moment. So the story goes like this. Mary Tipper Gore, who was married to then Senator Al Gore, bought her daughter Prince's Purple Rain album and was taken aback by some of the lyrics, specifically in the song titled Darling Nikki. And she was so displeased by what she heard that she started the Parental Music Resource Center, PMRC for short, with other women who are married to political figures. They even created a list of songs they deemed inappropriate, titling them the Filthy 15. I don't know why, but I'm like the Filthy 15. <laughs> gonna get right at, gonna get a little on roll at, get about up in a hurry. Right. They would be shocked by what's being made today. Some notable artists that were on there besides Prince was Madonna, ACDC, Def Leppard, and Twisted Sister. The PMRC grew out of the National PTA's campaign to have a rating system similar to film and television. They mailed letters nationwide to influential people as an effort to gain support. On August 8th, 1985, the RIAA sent a response document to the PMRC about their petition letters and agreed to a warning label. But the PMRC wanted to implement the rating system. And it'll go like this. O for Oculent, V for Violence, DA for Drug Alcohol Reference, and X for Sexually Explicit. And understandably so, there's pushback by many artists saying that the label could harm their record sales and reputation. Heavy metal and rock and roll were also very popular genres in the 80s. Gangster rap was starting to gain traction in the mainstream media. And we cannot have this music corrupting our youth! So on September 19th, 1985, just a few months after forming, the PMRC were able to get a Senate hearing. So all the artists that were there, Frank Zappa, Dee Snyder, and John Denver, were all against having a pal on their records and thought that having the lyrics printed on a sleeve in the album was much better. Frank Zappa and John Denver's meetings were mostly about children's comprehension, internalization of the music, while Dee Snyder's was mostly about how can we identify these more risque albums. And I wanna start with Twisted Sisters, Dee Snyder, because his is the one I watched first, and I will link all three of the videos in the description below if you're interested in watching, because they're pretty funny. <laughs> but also very interesting of the time of, yeah, of the 80s. Snyder shared what he believed to have been a better way for parents to identify if an album is suitable for their child or not. One, look at the album art cover. Two, the title of the album and the title of the tracks. And three, purchase the record and listen to it and then return it if you don't want it. I feel like it's very unrealistic to expect parents to want to take that extra step to purchase the album for one, and then listen to it and then return it. And wouldn't it be just as harmful to the artist's reputation if people kept returning their record and while the record store wanna keep selling something that the customers are clearly unhappy with? So I feel like that last point was the one thing I was like, really? But I'm glad that Snyder at least is a parent that would take that extra step. And I feel like I would too, but it's just very dependent on the artist. And even then I would just look up the lyrics. I don't even think I would listen to the song. 
The next one I watched was John Denver's and the committee was so fangirling. They just had to let him know that they were fans. Mr. Denver spoke so eloquently <laughs> and stating that stating to the committee that it helps to understand the mindset of the youth by what music they listen to. And also pointing out that there's nothing shown on TV and film that is much better nor worse than what is being sung in music. So monitoring what and how much music the child is listening to would also be a possible solution. Frank Zappa also made a film comparison and was the sassiest out of the three and clearly not a favorite of two of the senators, but some of them still had to let him know that they were fans. <laughs> that did not happen with D. Snyder. If anything, Senator Al Gore made sure to let him know that he was not a fan of his. <laughs> Possibly, mostly, no, actually, it's clearly because he mentioned his wife. <laughs> that was so funny. Y'all gotta watch that. It is hilarious to me. I have a quote here from Frank Zappa, and it says, An imposed rating system would stigmatize them as individuals. And this is in reference to how film and TV rating system does not have an effect on actors because they're playing characters. And I feel like this is a case by case type of situation, especially because of typecasting. And really, one actor I can think of is Seth Rogen, who instantly when I hear is in a new film, I instantly think that the movie is PG-13 or rated R. I know it's either one of those ratings unless I see that it's an animated film for families. But that's just one actor. Even like Megan Fox, because she's typecasted as this femme fatale, pretty girl. So I feel like a lot of her movies outside of Disney would be very PG-13, you know? Like there's certain type of characters artists typically play, and I say artists as in like actors as well. And I feel like certain type of roles are already in categories of ratings, especially how far is the writer and director trying to take it, you know? So, <laughs> you're kind of sort of right. A child's ability to comprehend and interpret lyrics was brought up in both John Denver and Frank Zappa's hearings, but there were different points and brought up by different senators. One question was asked by Senator Al Gore to John Denver, and it was a hypothetical scenario of a hypothetical artist releasing a song glorifying crepe and a hypothetical 10 year old listening to it. And this was John Denver's response. Uh, I don't think so. I'm not sure that there are many 10 year olds who know what it is. I'm not sure that I'm not sure I would agree with that. I feel like he should have said that not every 10 year old would know what crepe is and we really shouldn't expect them to. And really it's up to the guardians of the child to whether or not educate their child on what certain serious things are. And if your child comes home asking you questions about it, then I pray that you are prepared to explain it to them as best as you can. I'm gonna be 100 with y'all. I learned about this type of stuff, like serious criminal types of light crepe from the news, <laughs> from TV and film, and from school. I, I, I don't know, how did y'all learn about serious stuff? <laughs> Senator Hawkins brought up the child development levels on toys to Frank Zappa. For example, like this toy is for zero to two. And this is what Frank had to say. <laughs> do you object to that? In a way I do, because that means that somebody in an office someplace is tell making a decision about how smart my child is. So the RIAA created the PAL program, which artists had to submit a PAL license agreement if they would like to place the warning label on their records. The British phonographic industry adopted a similar system in the 1990s. This action is actually completely voluntary, which is surprising, but not at the same time, because it would go against the grounds of the First Amendment if it legally was required. And it's also the fact that the meaning of lyrics can be interpreted in multiple different ways, even further from what inspired the artist to create the song in the first place. And I'm sure placing the label is encouraged by the artist's team if they see that a fairly large portion of their listeners is under 18. But it only really attracted the youth to these albums and also was viewed as something edgy and cool to have in their collection. And really the parental advisory label was used as a marketing tool for record labels for different artists. So it was this edgy new cool thing for artists to have on their records and really it's like it was almost like a badge of honor really to have this on your record. The first 
first record to have the official RIAA explicit content label was banned in the USA by Two Life Crew in 1990. I guess the other drafts of the label the RIAA did not like. Some record stores didn't allow those under 18 to purchase a labeled album, and some stores even chose not to sell them at all. And this includes Walmart, surprisingly, and I never thought to actually pay attention to that, but I'll have to check it out the next time I go. And this label was first used for streaming services and online music stores in 2011. The label brought the rise in artists creating radio edits of certain songs and clean versions of their albums, which we all know the clean version of albums suck. I was going to say our crap, but they suck. Oh my gosh. And I'm going to talk more about this in the next chapter because it just shows the emphasis on what we deem appropriate or what is deemed inappropriate. And it just makes me wonder where is the music that is catered to the younger demographic? <laughs> If I'm going by the standards of today's music in the 2020s, clean versions of music still suck. <laughs> Artists just leave blanks in the music and it can take you out of the song. It can disrupt the flow and rarely is the production stylized to make it seem like it was intentional. The only artist that I can think of who takes the time to actually create alternate lyrics is Olivia Rodrigo. And if you know any others, please list them in the comments below. And really it just makes the performances on TV much better because you don't have, like the artist doesn't have to consciously not say the bad word or have to rely on the people who bleep out cuss words to keep them from saying it on TV. However, the downside to this is that if I'm going by Olivia Rodrigo, she doesn't perform any of her alternate versions on tour from what the clips I have seen, she doesn't. So not every parent would be okay with their child going to hear these lyrics in person, but it's kind of hard to sing all American bitch <laughs> without saying the bad words, you know what I mean? But well, bitch is a dog, so bark, bark. I feel like for my generation, Gen Z, we all kind of grew up differently because of how quickly technology has integrated itself into our daily lives. And according to Google, Gen Z is anyone born from 1997 to 2012. I am an end of the world baby, 1999 kids, raise your hands high. <laughs> and my cousins who are in the same generation as me view what I watch as old and my feelings are hurt if you cannot tell. <laughs> I grew up in the 2000s and the 2010s. Disney, Cartoon Network, and Nickelodeon were very popular during those times. Well, during the mid 2010s, they kind of started to fall off. But even then, Disney especially, and a little bit of Cartoon Network's actors had music coming out for their tween audience. I cannot say that music back then during, at least during the 2000s, were much cleaner than music today. But kids at least had options to listen to something else. If anything, I mostly, majority of my time, listen to artists that were on my favorite TV shows. In addition to Disney and Nickelodeon talent having music careers, social media was growing in popularity. YouTube especially in the late 2000s, and many artists were discovered on the platform. Justin Bieber, Becky G, Chloe and Halle by Beyonce, Madison Beer by Justin Bieber, and Ariana Grande. If you didn't know, Ariana also uploaded covers while being on Victorious and was seen by someone at Republic Records and has been signed to that record label ever since. Shawn Mendes was discovered through Vine, Ella Mae through Instagram, and Billie Eilish on SoundCloud with her song Ocean Eyes going viral. And I guess we can add a little Nas X with the song Old Town Road going viral on TikTok as a more recent example. But you guys, let me know if anyone else since then has been discovered on social media and has made it big in the mainstream because from my knowledge, I don't think anyone else has been. And the reason I bring this up in connection to the PA label is that any artist that was on Disney and signed to their label Hollywood Records were required to a level of censorship due to their connection with the mouse. Well, I don't know this for sure, it's just my educated guess, but parents were okay with their children listening to the music. And I guess to some degree Nickelodeon artists too, but not as strict because Nick shows tended to be more mature even with their jokes. <laughs> and I forgot to mention this while I was physically recording, but <laughs> did you know that the Goofy Goober song from Spongebob is a parody of Rock by Twisted Sister? I will never watch that same scene from the Spongebob movie the same ever again. <laughs> Other than Kids Bop, <laughs> can't say kiss Bob without cringing and laughing what their WAP remix should have not have even been considered <laughs> wings and pizza 
<laughs> the try not to laugh challenge for that is wild. But other than Kizbop, there really is no buffer of censorship anymore. The new young faces in the mainstream sing more about mature things, which isn't a bad thing, you know, as we learned from Olivia Rodrigo, teenagers can write about their experiences in very compelling ways. And I find it so very sad that a lot of I guess older people, at least I can tell from the interviews that she did, some of the interviews, that they were very surprised at how well she was able to write. And I'm, I am won't say I'm ashamed, but like I'm also one of those people who were very surprised. And, you know, as someone who also has been lyrically writing her own song since she was 12 years old, but you know, that just says a lot about what I thought about myself. <laughs> I'm a huge Olivia fan, okay? So don't come for me. <laughs> I love Olivia. But one thing's for sure that we cannot ignore that the new young faces are young adults singing about adult things. And I know that whatever is deemed appropriate is subjective. We just have to be mindful of what these young kids are internalizing and acting out. And going back to Frank Zappa about the age range on children's toys, you know, there has to be some form of guidance on what helps your child develop like the basic skills. <laughs> There has to be some form of guidance step-by-step -step pro process, you know? If I put out a chessboard in front of a one-year-old, they're not gonna know how to do it. They're just gonna chew on it, you know what I mean? Every child's comprehension level is different. Doesn't mean one is smarter than the other. It just means that maybe it wasn't explained to them in terms they understand. And this can be applied to lyrics and music. I used to be a child once, I know, shocker. Um, and, <laughs> and I watched a lot of little kids in my time. And typically, unless it's explained to them and other than the bad words, kids typically won't pick up on the more adult themes in music. <laughs> It'll go right over their heads. If anything, they'll make up their own lyrics, which makes it even more funny. And <laughs> I just want to say, you guys, for the record, that I am responsible. If I felt like something was a little bit too mature for the little kids I was watching, I made sure to turn it off. So... <laughs> I just want to make sure that's clear. And um, I remember watching the California Girls music video, Katy Perry's California Girls music video, all the time on a loop as a little kid. I never picked up on any of the more adult things in there. I just thought it was a pretty video. It's Candyland and the whipped cream cans. I just thought it was weird. <laughs> If anything, you know what, I watched for like the cute outfits and the gummy bear flipping her off. I just thought that was the funniest thing as a little kid. But you know, it was it was never that deep unless someone explained it to me and pointed out that it was bad. And we shouldn't expect artists to tiptoe around certain topics because they are catering to a specific demographic. And I also say in that same breath that it doesn't mean consumers, not just children, but adults as well, want to hear a lot of cuss words or, you know, risque type of lyrics all the time. I feel like the parental advisory label is just used as a blanket label for any and every artist. And it really doesn't warn you about what type of lyrics or what type of content is in the project it really heavily relies on the consumer already knowing about the artist or the genre of music that they're listening to which is why i feel that the pa label needs a makeover <laughs> Freedom of speech is what artists in the 80s felt like was being threatened. Frank Zappa even read off the First Amendment in his opening speech to the committee. At least that's what I think it's called. And from what I interpreted, I don't believe that was the issue, nor do I think the goal was to limit what artists can write about. I genuinely believe that it was about how can we inform potential listeners of what is on these records. And like I said, mentioned earlier about TV and film having their rating system. And I don't know if they had this back in the 80s, but you know how today in today's time, like on what is it like on Netflix, for example, um, I can think of the last airbender, the animated one, the animated one, the good one. <laughs> tried in that live action it wasn't as bad as i thought it was that costume design though whoever did that i need to look it up i'll put the person up here because they deserve to be shouted out they did their thing on the costume design but it was just it was just everywhere but they tried their best with it but anyways the animated original version of the last airbender i think it is rated tv7 and underneath it you will see fantasy violence the only part about that is that I don't agree with having 
the rating, like whatever they were saying about it, like the X and the O and V. We connected too heavily with what the MPPDA implemented with films. And I think that people would just be applying it to music and we don't really, we don't need that. So if the RIAA ever decided to adjust or to refresh the PAL for artists, I suggest that in small legible print that they should have the warning at the bottom of the face of the album or at the top on the back. And it should say in small print, warning, language, um, sexual content, um, drug, alcohol use, yada 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 we i mean it can have the pa the pal label on there maybe but i think even just having like switching to like small print at the bottom or at the top can also be really helpful also for those who don't have good eyesight i feel like a sticker is still pretty good <laughs> and for streaming services i feel like they should put the warnings in the description of the albums whatever songs containing bad words and or the descriptive direct intimacy in a stream cases WAP um, should have the E, E for explicit, like usual. And you know, like I said earlier, not every artist is the same level of explicit. And target demographics really do play a role in that. And having that extra context is very important. I will say these artists because I have them in my intro video, but like in cases with Olivia Rodrigo and Cardi B very different artists, very different levels of explicit. So I feel like having these descriptors underneath will be very helpful because it forces people to actually read, <laughs> read and actually examine the album, examine the work before actually buying, making an informed purchasing decision. You know, I, I would want that as a consumer even though I kind of already know the artist that I'm listening to or even if I'm trying to get into a new artist I think that'll be very helpful for what I'm also getting myself into but like I also mentioned earlier I read the lyrics so <laughs> but let me know in the comments down below what you guys think of pal and do you agree with any of my suggestions what are some of yours keep it respectful in the comments and I pray you all have a blessed rest of your day and an awesome rest of your week peace out